Okay, so um, I, I was uh, going to talk about um, how heavy are Sailor Mars flag holes and uh, this is not entirely up to date for one very simple reason. There is a, a deluge of results from O3 that haven't been published yet and there's some results that are actually adding considerably wealth of information to uh, the ones that are going to be uh, commenting on here. But uh, so the, the plan for the talk is this, I'm going to talk about very briefly the beginning of gravitational astronomy, although most of you attending the seminar uh, already know all this very well. But for the sake of completion, I think it's useful to do that. Then uh, I will be talking about the current status of interferometric detectors, uh, the O1 and O2 scientific observational campaigns, the first gravitational wave catalog, and then um, the main purpose of this talk is what are the inferences that we can make from the detections uh, regarding black hole populations and um, and, uh, and stellar evolution in general, and then what do we see uh, in the future for all this? Well, the beginning of gravitational wave astronomy is now uh, the cover of uh, historical uh, physical review letters from uh, slightly more than four years ago now. And in uh, the main results, uh, as you remember, was at, uh, at that time, uh, the detection of the gravitational waves emitted by um, binary black hole. One of the black holes was um, 36 solar masses. The other one was about 29 solar masses. The final black hole has 62 solar masses. And uh, essentially three solar masses were radiated in gravitational waves. And the luminosity distance was essentially uh, a, little more, uh, a little bit more than 1200. Uh, light years away, so uh, 410 uh, megaparsecs, with with uh, some some respectable um, errors, of course. And uh, this was a historic result. All the uncertainties were within 90% credible intervals. Uh, the observations uh, clearly show the existence of binary black hole systems. Um, something that uh, was speculated, but, um, but there was no way to observe before this. It was the first direct detection of gravitational waves and the first observation of the binary black hole merger because although we've speculated that uh, binary black hole um, should be out there, uh, it wasn't clear in terms of a stellar evolution if those uh, were merging in, um, in, in the lifetime of our universe. And uh, so there were right now three scientific runs, but uh, I'm gonna be talking about the first two because uh, as a member of the LIGO Scientific Collaboration, I'm bound to wait until the results from all three are published and they haven't been published yet. Although I'm gonna throw a few hints. Uh, so, but for the very first two runs, uh, there was uh, a, the published first gravitational wave catalog. Um, in by O2, also near the end of O2, uh, a third uh, gravitational wave detector was added to the network um, uh, formed by the LIGO Livingstone and the LIGO Hanford Observatory. And, um, and that was very important because uh, as as I will show you, and as some of you probably already know, um, this allowed for much better uh, localization. So it was diminishing um, the, um, the, the large scale probability localization maps that we had when there is only one or two detectors in the network. And um, so during 01, there were three uh, binary black hole mergers detected. And uh, during the second observing run that uh, went from November 30th to um, 2016 to August 25th, uh, 2017, 
Um, that's so the first detection of gravitational wave from binary neutron star is the famous binary uh, neutron star uh, merger of um, um, August 17, 2017. And there were a total of seven binary black hole mergers. So um, an important figure emerged with the detectors is to see um, the binary neutron star uh, range. That means uh, not the horizon. In some sense, the range is more like the average distance at which um, uh, binary neutron star mergers can be detected. The reach of gravitational wave detectors is larger uh, for binary black holes because they're more massive than neutron stars and um, the amplitude um, scales uh, directly with the mass and it scales inversely with the distance. So there is a compensation. You can see things uh, because they're more massive, they're higher away uh, that we can see uh, for uh, typical neutron star masses that are only a couple of uh, solar masses. And you can see um, in, in your screen, uh, the, the range that was achieved by the end of the second run was uh, for the LIGO Livingstone, uh, it, it got to about 100 megaparsecs for my interesting stars. And for um, uh, LIGO Hanford was slightly less, actually even worked a little bit less. Uh, it wasn't as good as, as the, the beginning of the run. And LIGO Virgo has ways to go, but it was around 30 um, um, megaparsecs range, which is uh, the range that um, uh, LIGO uh, had in their first observing run. So it, 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 it wasn't that bad. Yeah, here you can see the, um, uh, the power spectrum uh, noise uh, so the strain noise is in the vertical axis. Uh, the frequency, they're both logarithmics. So you can see uh, the sensitivity in, in, the, in the best uh, band. Uh, it got to 10 to the minus 23. And remember, this is a strain, which is how much the distance changes divided by the distance of the arms, which is four kilometers. So it's, it, it has no dimensions. If you want to have particular dimensions, all you need is to multiply by a kilometer there. So essentially you get um, to 10 to the minus 20 uh, in meters. And in terms of uh, the distances that can be uh, measured by the detector at, uh, at the peak of the sensitivity band, which as you can see is around 110 uh, Hertz. So these uh, bananas are essentially the area of the sky where the source could be localized. As you can see, uh, most of them are very large, particularly because most of them we are um, observed with only two detectors. But when we have the chance to use the three detectors, those areas get much smaller. And, um, and you can see with the gravitational away 17, away 17, the binary neutral star merger, that was about 30. Uh, square degrees. Still 30 square degrees is the place where you're going to have a place of the sky. It's the region of the sky where you're going to have a lot of galaxies. So um, that's the reason why wide uh, field of view telescopes are necessary in particular to scan that region of the sky and see if we can find the source. Uh, in particular with this one we got so lucky that uh, it, you know, a lot of observatories and places, including the group, got to see it. And uh, it was also seen in, in gamma rays, X-rays, ultraviolet, infrared. And even nowadays, after almost three years, um, I just saw papers uh, from SWIFT. By the way, that's another possible topic for the astrophysics seminar. Uh, SWIFT uh, detected uh, X-rays from GW170817. Um, so it, it's, it's still, um, uh, we still can observe it. The fact that we can still observe, uh, I haven't read that paper. I, I just want to speculate because it occurred to me, we, we don't know if a black hole was formed or we still have just one heavy neutral star there. 
uh, I think uh, having uh, x-rays observed could be very interesting because that might be coming from an accretion disk and that might be providing information if what you have inside is a black hole or not. Uh, or maybe not, because even, even that, it could be still an neutron star. But it would be interesting to read that paper and someone is willing to read that paper uh, from SWIFT and, uh, and, and present that uh, one of the future seminars, I think uh, uh, that will be uh, a, a very good topic to have. So the O3 scientific run uh, it started on April uh, 1st, 2019. It was supposed to end April 30th of this year. And it was some speculation that if things were going well, um, you know, to continue probably through June. Well, as you probably know, um, as of uh, tomorrow, Friday, March the 28th, uh, all three is gonna stop. Uh, essentially because of the global pandemic. And uh, it was considered better uh, for the health of operators and, and everybody uh, to stop operations. Um, there was only one month short, it's almost um, a, a full year of uh, operations that is obtained. And, um, and the idea was these last few days, particularly do uh, serial tests calibration tests, knowing very well the, the uh, state of the, of the uh, detector and, and the, all, all the environmental sensors so that, that uh, data can be um, uh, safely kept and perform all the analysis from now until um, uh, 04 starts. And, you know, there were several questions about this. In, in the sense, uh, what's going to happen next? Well, all four was scheduled for the end of 2021 or beginning 2022. And uh, of course, at this point, nobody can say what's going to happen because, um, you know, the whole world is going through an uncertainty that is even way much more severe than not knowing when all four starts. So, so we're going to be resuming all three. Um, so that's the reason why to great extent there is not an answer to this, but uh, uh, I, th I think it, it's okay. It's not the worst promise that we have right now. So during the, yes, yes, by all means, yes, yes. Yes, uh, yeah, it's just a general question. Um, so from the first uh, uh, detection, we know that the, uh, for example, 30 solar mass black hole, 30 solar mass black hole merge, and then it doesn't become 60 mass uh, black hole, but say it becomes 55 solar mass black hole, and then the loss, mass loss, the five solar mass becomes the gravitational wave. Am I correct? That's correct. Actually, in the first one, if you take the, 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 the mean estimated values, uh, there were, um, I think it was 36 and 29, that, that gives the 65 solar masses combined, but the, the, the final black hole was 62 solar masses. So there were three solar masses and needed a gravitational radiation. So right. that's correct. So uh, that uh, lost mass, is whether uh, my my question is whether the lost mass is always the same, only depending on the initial mass of two black holes, or whether the lost mass, which ultimately becomes the gravitational wave, uh, depends on say the orbit of the two uh, binary black holes and other parameters. Well, uh, it, I think I think yours is an excellent question. I think the main parameter is the mass, and to great extent, uh, we can look at all the detections and see that it's pretty much about the same fraction of the mass. But uh, definitely, you're right um, because there are several parameters, like the spins of the black holes, the total spin of the system, and those values do change a little bit, and they're going to have an influence in uh, the final uh, 
um, uh, energy that is emitted, but um, it, it's, I, I, I'm not sure what, with the constraints that we have on the values that we get, how much can we say about that and the influence of those parameters. Uh, so far, it, from all the detections that we have, my perception is that it's pretty much uh, uh, sort of the similar fraction. But this is it's, it's, it's a good question. And, uh, and uh, I'm, I'm not 100% sure how the parameters really affect uh, that. Uh, I do have the belief that, that they should have some some effect, although maybe too subtle to 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 detect. And the uh, uh, signal from the uh, gravitational wave becomes uh, uh, bigger for the bigger lost mass. Am I correct? Well, it, it becomes bigger for the bigger mass that the the the, the black holes have. Uh, so if the black holes are heavier, then you, the amplitude goes uh, like like the mass. It scales like the mass, and it scales inversely with the distance. And but of course, you also um, have a frequency that depends on the masses of the objects, and uh, and that enters. So the, the main uh, the main uh, physical quantity. Uh, that is defined when you look at the mergers is what is called the chirp mass, which is a combination of the masses uh, of the object and essentially encodes the frequency and uh, and the distance to the source. And um, so the beauty with uh, gravitational waves is you measure you know, uh, the frequency, you measure the masses, and you measure the distance to, to the source, which is right. something that that you don't do with electromagnetic waves. So as we have uh, better and better and more sensitive detectors, uh, we will become uh, able to detect uh, uh, smaller uh, mass uh, binary black holes, say five solar mass uh, black <coughs> hole, five solar mass black hole, uh, when they merge becomes say eight solar mass black hole with current, uh, Detector sensitivity, we may we may not be able to detect those uh, relatively low mass uh, binary black holes, but in the future maybe we can even uh, detect those low mass binary black hole mergers. Am I correct? Yeah, what you're saying is essentially correct. But remember that also the distance gets into the equation. So uh, you know the lower mass. Uh, we're going to be able to detect at, 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 at longer distances as we reach better sensitivity and and, and vice versa but uh, but it's true uh, you know more sensitive detectors are going to have more precise measurements not only that um, something that is not measured very well it it's it, there's some subtleties because depending on the mass is when um, the signal of the objects get into the detector, into the band where we can detect. Because, for example, the binary um, pulsar, Holtz and Taylor, is emitting gravitational waves right now. We won't ever detect it with, with LIGO because the, the frequency of those gravitational waves are in the millihertz band. And this detects in, in you know the the, the 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 peak of the sensitivity is in hundred hertz, but as 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 these objects are, are, are uh, merging and or close to measure, they start getting into uh, the detector band, particularly with the black holes, and and we see also with the neutron star, the neutron stars we get to observe more than two seconds because they get into the band of, of the detector. So it, it, a lot of things do depend on that. And, and with um, Einstein telescope, with uh, you know, third generation detectors that are gonna be sensitive to lower frequencies, um, we're gonna be able to see more of, of, of the merger. So see before the merger, 
actually happens, get to see the last instance of the dance before the collision. And, uh, and also, um, you know, after the collision, you have this rain down that um, we don't have a lot of uh, sensitivity to extract all the information. Eventually, we will, and with, uh, you know, with uh, better detectors. And, uh, and that's going to be important to be able to say a lot of things. For example, uh, black holes have no hair because they are really very well described by the, 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 the Kerr solution of Einstein's equations. And uh, you, can, you, know, you can do the perturbation equations and look at this that are called uh, semi uh, or quasi-normal modes. And, uh, but we cannot look at those quasi-normal modes now with the current sensitivity we would in the future. So uh, uh, future better detectors are gonna allow for more detailed astrophysics from, from the mergers, definitely, by all means. Okay. <clears throat> so, make some suggestion. I don't know if, but perhaps you already know the, the answer. But if we do an analog with the electromagnetic wave, that is the classical uh, case, we see that if we have a particle that is uh, oscillating with a frequency and certain amplitude, then we can calculate the energy of the associated wave. Then when we now consider two holes, that is two black holes, for example, and they are rotating. Well, we can decompose in the, in the perpendicular oscillation modes, and we can find an, an amplitude and a, a frequency for that. And we say, well, the gravitational wave have to be associated to that. But here we have something extra no, that we don't have in electromagnetism, which is that the, the mass of the system also is uh, changed, that is, we lost mass. And yeah. we have to give an additional I don't know if what the wave that you are measuring already is the one that is coming already from the collision or if you can measure the wave that is before the collision that is produced by the... Well, yeah, it, it, it's measured uh, milliseconds before the collision. And... Uh, but we, in, before it means that the masses still are, are fixed for the two particles. That's okay. correct. So you, you get to see you get to see when it's a two body. Very close, actually it already so in in the evolution, at least in the evolution that we know using post Newtonian evolution of, of two bodies in, in Einstein's equations, because you cannot solve that uh, in close uh, form like you, you can do with Newton's equation. Um, there is something called the innermost circular orbit. So we know very well the evolution of that using post Newtonian uh, and the, and the evolution. Those, no? Then after the, 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 they the, went through the innermost uh, circular orbit and the plunge happened, which is milliseconds really, milliseconds. Um, we, we need to use full numerical simulation, numerical relativity. And, but the good thing is we really get, and uh, we get to see it uh, before the, the final merger. So we, we get to see a, a good piece of, of the collision of black holes before the collision and after the collision. Oh, yeah. and, uh, and, and that's important because it, it, it all matches out what we know from the theory. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Then perhaps you can Thank you. Questions. Yeah, uh, yeah. So, um, well, in 403, this is, this is a talk I gave in Mexico last month. And uh, by the time I, I uh, gave the talk, there were 51 detections. I think there were uh, close to five or six more. So we are close to 60 detections for all three, uh, very few retractions. And um, um, there was a, uh, let me see. There was a second binary neutron star measure that's interesting to mention here. That happened uh, last year on April 25th, and um, it was published just uh, two months ago. 
uh, because uh, it took some time to do the analysis. And uh, one of the masses is between 1.6 and 2.5 solar masses, and the other between 1.1 and 1.7 solar masses. So the final mass of the is between 3.1 and 3.7. This is pretty amazing because this suggests that there is a population of binary neutron star system that we're not seeing electromagnetically. You know, this is sub hour. In other words, these objects go around each other in less than an hour. To compare, the Holson and Taylor binary, the famous binary pulsar, takes about seven hours to complete the revolution. Notice that they complete that revolution in a distance that is about two million kilometers, so it's slightly higher than, the, it's almost one astronomical unit for, uh, for uh, the whole spinal uh, Taylor pulsar. So these ones are definitely much uh, closer and, and, uh, and for, for a long part of their lives. And, um, and being at, uh, at least an, uh, an hour in orbital periods, um, it's, uh, it, it seems, I, I, I'm not an expert in, in radio astronomy, so it seems that it's, uh, it's not detectable. Uh, in with the current electromagnetic service, and um, so so that's one of one of the surprises with those O three. And, and what uh, is that, uh, final object uh, that a little over three solar mass is that final object the neutron star or black hole? We don't know. Okay. We don't know. It could very well be a black hole, but then it would be a black hole of a mass that was never seen. Or if it's just a neutron star, it's a neutron star heavier than any neutron star that has ever been detected. So th this is one of the interesting puzzles of uh, the gravitational wave of astronomy. It's, it's, it's bringing on board now. If the neutron star, it would be a revolution, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, well, yeah. <laughs> but, but yeah, but it, it, you know, this is uh, <laughs> this is the challenge of the post uh, to theory, and, uh, <laughs> and and here here it comes you know what I said about um, better detector, new generation of detector, because if you can get the ring down, the the ring down, it's going to be very different if you get a black hole than if you get a neutron star. In other words, the object that is formed at the end is a neutron star, then it's gonna look very different the way, you know, after the merger than if it's an, uh, a black hole. But we don't have enough sensitivity to discriminate that. No, yet. So this is, this, this is interesting. And um, so, and, and depending on, on the, as, estimation that we made. We have big uncertainties in measure what is called um, defective spin spin parameter. And, and I'll show you uh, in, in a little while. But um, what, what is interesting is that uh, while the probability density points to subjects here, we are measuring an object that is essentially here in this range of, of masses for uh, this particular observation. The total mass is here. So um, the two curves are because assuming that the, the spin is it's almost zero, um, you get this uh, mass. And then it's, it's a bit more uncertain if the spin is much uh, higher than that. But it's still, you know, we, no matter what, we have a big, a big and mass. The spin was already detected? That is, they, they know what is the spin or? Well, the, 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 the speed has a big uncertainty. I, I'm going to be talking about this in a minute. We, we have a big uncertainty, but it seems that the most objects that we are detecting are, are detecting with very low effective spin. Uh, but I'm going to talk about that in, in a minute. So uh, one thing I want to uh, mention now, let me see because otherwise you don't see very well. Uh, I want to talk about the mass gap. So what is the famous mass gap? Actually, there are 
I would say there are two uh, mass gaps, but, but the mass gap is if you have objects, uh, this is in the two axes, we have the mass of the binary system. So if you have them, we know that our neutron stars are between one and three solar masses. And uh, we know that if we are, uh, one of the objects larger than five solar masses and up to three, then we have a neutron star at black hole colliding and we detected a couple of those as well. And, um, and we know that objects that are more than five solar masses definitely cannot be neutron stars, those are black holes. But there's this uncertainty in, in this green region that is these objects that we don't know if they're neutron stars or, or black holes. And uh, so if they are black holes, then uh, we don't have enough uh, sensitivity. Uh, well, I already mentioned this. And uh, le let me, because looking at the time, and you know, I love that we have discussion. This is much better than having, uh, you know, someone speaking all the time. But, uh, but that means I'm gonna rush through some slides and concentrate on the ones that are uh, probably more interesting to discuss here. So um, by um, was January, I believe, I forgot now, but I see le less than three months to go, Kagura, the Japanese detector joined the collaboration. It's, they're still under commissioning, but they're taking data. The data is not as sensitive as, as the LIGO and Virgo detectors. But that means that by, for, by 04, uh, we are expecting Kagra to be part of the network. What is interesting about Kagra is this cryogenic. So it, it's going to uh, add some interesting um, uh, features to um, the, the uh, network of detectors. And so definitely it's, it's a welcome uh, addition. And the LIGO vehicle collaboration now is not LIGO vehicle collaboration anymore. It's called the LVK. It's called the LIGO Virgo Kagra collaboration. So it has officially incorporated uh, the Japanese partners into um, the, the worldwide collaboration. The future run uh, projections for running are, uh, you can see them here. So essentially by the end of uh, 2021, uh, we expected to be close to 200 megaparsecs. And I do hope that by then, you know, we, humankind, uh, beat the pandemic and uh, UTRGV has started us operating at the science sensitivity in Macomb because. Uh, imagine the things that we're going to be able to detect with this sensitivity. It's, it's, it's going to be pretty interesting for detecting kilonovi. And for all five, that essentially is going to be in 20, uh, 2025, 2026, uh, we're going to be reaching these sensitivities and uh, eventually LIGO India is going to be participating. And um, so, well, I'm not going to talk about the public alerts. I was explaining this because uh, I gave this talk to an audience that uh, um, probably wasn't all that familiar with this. So uh, going into the astrophysics of what we're doing. So uh, the coalescence of binary compass objects, gravitation of astronomy can give us information about um, stellar and, and binary evolution. Um, before the merge of the, of the binary objects. It, it, it could explain how mass transfer happens in binary systems and, uh, and, and then provide an understanding of what is called the common envelope phase evolution. I'm gonna be talking about this in a little bit. Um, we're gonna maybe be able to understand better uh, supernova explosion, particularly for very massive stars and, and how mass loss happens and uh, and you know, the, the motion of these objects as uh, conservation of angular momentum essentially is ejecting them from uh, where the uh, place to where the explosion happens. Um, if we happen to uh, observe far and away, then we're gonna get redshift uh, information. And uh, that's also gonna uh, tell us a lot about a star formation of the universe. 
it, it also made, uh, it might let us uh, understand better the dynamics uh, that exist in global clusters. By the way, I want to recommend um, to uh, those of you who might be interested in the topic, this uh, review uh, by Mandel and, and Farmer. Actually, I think I have, um, I have it here. Um, merging stellar uh, mass binary black holes. The review is from 2018, but it's, this is done really like a review. It's almost like a, a nice textbook on uh, binary evolution system uh, in the process of uh, uh, forming uh, binary black holes. So uh, um, if anyone is interested in the topic, I strongly recommend reading this review. And um, so I'm going to follow some of uh, the analysis that I do there. This is the, the first gravitation away catalog where you can see here uh, the neutron star and all the different um, binary black hole mergers that we observe. Imagine now this, it's going to be multiplied by a factor of five almost. So it's, it's, it's going to be phenomenal. And uh, what I like about this picture, and I think it's good to look at, in purple, you have the isolated uh, black holes that we detected because they are part of what are called um, uh, X-ray binaries. So these are objects, um, black holes essentially, that have an accretion disk that because of the incredible speeds that the particles in the accretion experiment moving around the black hole emit X-rays and are detected through X-ray satellites. And um, we can infer the properties of the mass inside the accretion disk, and we know that those are black holes. So since 1970, when we detected the first of these sources, we know that uh, there are essentially about 20 plus of them that we know of in our galaxy. Uh, I think there are a couple outside our galaxy. But look now at uh, some of the, neutron, the black holes that we observe how much heavier are, you know, can very quickly see this. So the, the way to read this uh, graph is um, in the vertical axis, you have masses, higher masses are up. And then the horizontal axis actually has no meaning whatsoever. And here you have the neutron stars, masses are lower. Here's where you have the first uh, neutron star merger that was served. There is another one that as you uh, explained, is gonna be a little bit higher here because it has higher mass. And um, well, I already talked about uh, black holes and X-ray binaries. This is the way we measure the effective spin. So you have uh, the spin. So we have a, a binary system. It has a total spin, which is the total angular momentum of the, of the system. But then each black hole has its individual spin. So you can look uh, with this angle at the projection that it has on the orbital plane particular direction of the spin for each object. And you can construct this quantity, the effective uh, spin parameter, that is, is a way that um, some of the spins of each object over the projection on the, on the plane and the masses of each object. So this is what we actually measure, or what is measured in, um, uh, in with gravitational waves. And pretty much the results for O2, notice that except for this one, the purple one, pretty much all the objects are close to zero in the effective spin parameter. And uh, here is the summary of the different parameters. Look how heavy this one is. Uh, and uh, so this is between O1 and O2 was the heaviest detected. By the way, there now there have been uh, uh, a detection, uh, I think it happened a few months ago. Uh, it hasn't been published yet, but this is essentially the final black hole. It's about 150 solar masses. So this is essentially uh, throwing away the theories about the fact that uh, supernovae explosions cannot uh, give away 
black holes at more than 50 solar mass because there is a process, uh, a runaway process that happens um, that essentially ejects a lot of mass before the explosion can happen. So um, essentially when, when you have these massive stars that uh, are they going, uh, um, uh, running out of fuel, uh, uh, blow a lot of their mass away. And, uh, but if that's true, uh, we cannot explain how we detected uh, black holes that are heavy, particularly in they're so far away um, that in terms of stellar evolution, that cannot be explained by that. I think uh, people are talking about uh, regarding those uh, very high mass uh, black holes uh, in terms of the initial mass and final mass relation, uh, it seems there is a, a dependency on the metallicity of the stars. Correct. Yeah, and I'm going to be talking about that a little bit. Yeah, so I believe those extremely heavy uh, black holes uh, the low metallicity uh, black holes. Well, and, and that's a problem. It depends on the formation, on the channels through which black holes are formed. And this is, is, is still an open question. And gravitation of wave having, having been able to, uh, hasn't been able to rule out uh, any channel yet. So it's, 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 it's still an open question. This is precisely what we're going to be talking about because actually this is the main uh, I guess, topic of, of my seminar, the different channels through which we can have black holes. And if we can quickly go back to uh, slide 23, slide number 23. So it looks like there's a, a kind of a distinction between the mass of the uh, black holes detected by the gravitational wave and mass of the black holes detected by the electromagnetic waves. But that's as, correct. Yeah, as the sensitivity of the gravitational wave detector improves, I believe we will ultimately detect uh, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten solar mass uh, black holes through the gravitational wave detection. So there'll be an overlap. But what I'm uh, interested in is whether uh, we will detect these 40 solar mass, 50 solar mass black holes through the electromagnetic wave detection. So whether uh, the complete overlap of the black hole mass, entire range of black hole mass, either from the electromagnetic wave or uh, gravitational wave. Well, you're posing an extremely interesting question because actually that, that goes back to the uh, formation channels of black holes and essentially binary systems and, and, and how mass transfer happens in binary systems. I, I don't want to go beyond the 3 p.m. So I, I, I'm going to concentrate on the, on the final um, um, slides, particularly talking about uh, these formation channels. So, <clears throat> uh, if we measure the distribution of mass, spin, and redshift at the time of merger for binary black holes, we can try to make some inferences about binary black hole history and the physics behind it. Uh, well, we need to parameterize binary black holes to compare models and speculate how they evolve. And uh, as I said before, they have several formation channels. And let's try to take a look at, at, at them. So, Chemical composition, uh, like uh, Hugh Chul said, Dr. Lee said, uh, determine the history of, of black hole masses. Black hole masses depend on the mass of the parent star before the collapse of the supernova explosion and by the amount of mass that is ejected during the supernova. Very massive stars may collapse directly into black holes and the metal fraction, we call it Z, of a star determines the mass loss in a stellar wind. Actually, it yeah, and uh, some authors suggest that mass start losing their mass via uh, winds, the maximum black hole masses are only around 15 solar masses. Uh, I think that uh, it's been shown that it's 
not really true. And um, I, the, probably the reason for trying to justify this is, is because the, the X-ray binary show these low masses, but for high mass uh, black hole, we need lower metallicity environments. So um, it, it, let me say a few things about a stellar population, particularly for the students that participate in this seminar and haven't uh, taken astronomy classes. So the stellar population in, in, in the 1940s, um, I had a, a German astronomer differentiated between what are called population one and population two. So population stars were formed about um, 1,000 to 15,000 million years ago. And they have uh, about 10 to 100 less heavier elements uh, than helium, the population one. Um, so this, this are population two. And population two is essentially what you find in, in, in galaxies like ours. This is a, a photograph taken at our site in where Toros is. Um, by Samantha Fuentes, uh, was a, a student in our program. And um, it seems uh, we all believe that pretty much if you had a chance to get away from the galaxy, it would look like uh, M101, uh, it's, it's a spiral galaxy. So galaxies like this, you can see that are bluer here, and uh, these are populations two stars, and you have population one stars at, at, at the core. But also, it's speculated there um, another population star called population three that they essentially form uh, with no heavy metals at all because they were formed early in the universe. So, population one uh, are the youngest stars with the highest metallicity out of all three populations. And uh, so, regarding the channels and the forming uh, binary black holes. So you can have binary black holes that form from isolated massive binaries through what is called common envelope evolution. I'm gonna show you a couple of uh, cartoons. Or they can be formed via chemically homogeneous evolution, or they can be formed uh, via dynamical processes in a stellar cluster, or uh, also uh, dynamical processes in galactic nuclei. And uh, so, um, then also you can have gas drag and stellar scattering in accretion disk around supermassive black holes. And uh, they could have been originated the Big Bang as part of a primordial black hole population. Uh, but this is, 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 is a bit controversial. And, um, and each of these different channels of formation are gonna give a different distribution of masses, speeds, distance, and binary black hole orbit. So going to the cartoon, see here you have the common envelope. Let's say that you had two stars that are big. These are stars, regular stars, but just massive. 100 uh, solar masses, 75 solar masses, about 10 astronomical units distance. They have low metallicity. And, um, but then eventually they're getting closer and um, a hydrogen rich envelope expands from the uh, more massive star passing what is called the Roche lobe, that's the equal potentials between the two objects, and essentially it's gonna be uh, gotten into the other star. Uh, the separation uh, might get a little bit uh, wider, and, but eventually um, the primary stars is gonna lose, um, it, it's gonna exhaust fuel, it's gonna become what is called a, a naked helium burning star, those are called wolf ray stars, and then eventually it's gonna to collapse to a black hole. But then after about 100,000 years, the process reverses, the other star starts uh, giving mass to the black hole, and then uh, you're gonna get an unstable mass transfer. It's gonna uh, lead to the formation of a common envelope gas. Uh, orbital energy is gonna decrease, releasing the envelope, and you're gonna get um, a black hole and uh, a wolf ray uh, binary that's probably gonna be separated by um, around 35 uh, million kilometers, essentially 35 times the radius of the sun. And, and then eventually you get a binary black hole that is formed through this way of forming that what we call this particular channel. Or <clears throat> the other thing that you can get 
it's a chemical homogeneous evolution. Um, you have two stars, and essentially they can get tightly locked in some way similar to what happened the moon and the earth. And they're gonna go through a, a, a period that's gonna be synchronized, they're gonna be rotating fast. This is gonna create temperature gradients in the star. Temperature gradients themselves are gonna create convection in the gas, so it's gonna lead to something that is called a chemical mixing. Uh, hydrogen is gonna go to the core, helium to the envelope, and all the hydrogen is gonna fuse into helium. So it's a way into uh, being able to keep uh, burning hydrogen. Then eventually the stars are gonna um, uh, evolve into wall rayet uh, naked helium stars. It won't be any binary mass transfer, but these stars could form larger uh, uh, black holes. It could be that actually this is the way that we're observed, at least uh, Mega Mandel, Mandel are, are proposing this, and that's the way you get the, the heavy two um, uh, black holes in, in a binary system. And um, I'm just gonna show one more cartoon, which is a dynamical evolution channel in which you get uh, black holes that are forming dense environments, and so you, you see the collisions that happen, they sink to the center, mass segregation, they form binaries of three body interaction. The light, this object is ejected, interaction with other objects harden the binary, sulfur binaries are disrupted, and the binary will be hardened in air that eventually merges and make gravitational waves. This is gonna happen in environments where you actually have a lot of um, astrophysical objects, and so like low light clusters and, uh, in places where you have all your stars. Well, I'm gonna skip the, the, the few slides explaining the parameters and how we obtain all that, and just go to the conclusions of what we observe. Um, if, if someone wants to read the summary, um, I, I, I can provide it, but it, it's, it's gonna be a little bit uh, technical, and it's, I don't wanna take more time than uh, the one that was allotted. But essentially, um, what happens looking at the data from this uh, 01 and 02 is the idea was to simulate different environments considering the different parameters they obtained and look at uh, assuming different metallicities what we observe. And um, so you can see here uh, the mass gaps that we observe up here uh, in, in the black hole range and up here in the neutron star uh, range. And, and these are pretty much the evolution curves. Um, so these are the gravitational wave events. And using the different models that we have with the different channels, this is uh, what, what you can see in terms of, of the evolution. And uh, um, this is the ZAMS means zero age main sequence star. Uh, so this divided by solar masses, uh, it, depending uh, so uh, with the different uh, prescriptions that you have for metallicity and the different uh, the mass of the contact or the mass of the solar star, you can get uh, this type of, of evolutions. And um, I, I'm gonna it, it, this is an analysis of the values that we can infer, but be, they have big uncertainties. So again, I'm gonna jump with this. And I'm going to concentrate on the on the main result. Uh, <clears throat> where are my main result summary essentially? So the mass distribution of the more massive black holes in the binary black holes is well approximated by models that essentially have no more than one percent of black holes more massive than forty-five solar masses, and a power law index of. Uh, this power law essentially tells you how big the masses can be uh, with 90% credibility. The binary black holes are unlikely to be composed of black holes with large spins aligned to their orbital angular momentum. And modeling the evolution of the binary black hole merger rate with uh, uh, redshift, it, it is appear flat or increasing with redshift with 88% probability. Marginalizing over the uncertainties of the binary black hole population, the binary black hole merger rate density is essentially about 53 mergers per gigaparsec per year. And uh, 
The gravitational wave events that we observe today do not provide conclusive information about the astrophysics of binary black holes and their progenitor. That's the reason why I didn't go into the technical details. Those of you who are interested, I'll be happy to, to provide the presentation. Uh, but the observations imply, that's probably the most important conclusion, a binary black hole merger rate that goes between 10 to 200 gigaparsecs per year. And, and this points to the prospect of tens of detections in the next observing run. Um, notice that this is not saying anything about happen. And we know that actually we, we got more than 50. And, um, and uh, so this is going to increase with, with, uh, with the future runs. The detection is going to uh, provide a wealth of information. And eventually, we might get some surprises. And what is interesting is, although now we cannot say very much about the different channels that I mentioned, uh, I think we're going to learn much more in the next few years uh, about this. And with this, uh, I'll finish on time my presentation. Thank you. Excellent. That, 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 that's a funny part. I mean, <laughs> uh, a lot okay. Of, for the future, yeah. Yeah. Uh, question, comments, anything that you want to say, or what is going to be the topic of our next presentation? Mario, let me ask a question that is, uh, in regard with these three solar mass uh, neutron star, what will be the next step? That is how we can know if it is a real thing or do you know if there is any plan to, to go over that? Or? Well, I, I can tell you about my dreams. And my dreams are to have Taurus working you know, now with the pandemic, I couldn't go to Argentina, where it's supposed to be this week, you know. Uh, and, uh, but uh, I think there are good prospects for um, having Taurus working. The reason why I'm, I'm, I'm talking a lot about Taurus is because this is going to be a wonderful tool. Um, but also, it, it's something interesting. Today, as a member of LIGO, I had to vote on a memorandum of understanding with two observatories, DL-40 um, and Assassin. You know, Assassin, a beautiful name, Assassin. It's a small telescope, it's smaller than Toros, but it's the best supernova explosion finder um, in the world. And they track a lot of the supernovae that are formed because they essentially follow GRBs and they get a lot of data. So the idea as, as uh, so, so I think that this, this is manifold in, in the sense we're going to be observing supernovae, hopefully, in the next five years in gravitational waves. We're going to be observing more kilonovae. All these observations should be putting constraints on the astrophysics that we are observing. And uh, in other words, I think we need more observations. And, and I also, I think that we probably, it's, it's interesting to have more modeling and more theoretical analysis um, that can feed into what are going to be observing in, in, in the media future. Yeah, and mainly more precise observation. You know that the, the error is not so high that then we don't know if to believe or not. Because if really there is a, a three solar mass neutron star, that will be a revolution because I don't have idea how to go up to there with any equation of a state. Hmm. To go to two is, is already a big challenge. We are yeah. taking already the extreme of the parameters that, that we use. And to go to three, that will be a big challenge. But we have to be sure, you know, that... Yeah, and yeah, and that's, that's the reason why, you know, with science, all you can do is say within the margin of errors, this is what we have. But the margin of error sometimes precludes any, uh, 
bold statement because it, it won't be justified. So we cannot say it's a neutral star because it could be a black hole. Yeah. And, uh, and, and, and that's reality for now, but no, I think the beauty of, of this be, field. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. No, that the question will be how will be the, the pronostic for the, the decrease of the error, you know? Oh, it, it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be improving. The sensitivity is going to be improving. It's going to be improving, definitely. Because uh, when I, I use as a main figure of merit for sensitivity, the range, but as you go in, outside into the range, you probably for those that are outside, you know, very uh, in the horizon of what you reach, you're still going to have the same uncertainties that we have in the detection that we have so far. But then we're still going to have the detections at ranges similar to the one that we have now. And those are going to have more precision than in the past. So that, that's what it means that we're going to be able to see farther away. It means that objects that are at scales that we're seeing now are going to be seen with better precision. 